Welcome to section 17.6. So general people, what we're going to do is we're going to continue our discussion on colligative properties. The next concept that I want to discuss with you guys is this concept of osmosis. Now the key thing to remember with osmosis is we are going to employ something called the semi-permeable membrane. And so you guys can see this in our little diagram right here. What the semi-permeable membrane does is it allows certain things to pass and other things will not pass this barrier. So the setup that I want to explain osmosis with is this picture right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this tube and it is going to be shaped in a U. Now on the bottom of the tube is going to be my semi-permeable membrane. And what this membrane is going to do is it's going to allow water molecules to pass back and forth. So what you guys see in the blue spheres right here, this can go back and forth through that membrane or this little roadblock that I have in this picture. Now, what can't pass through this membrane is going to be my solute particles. They are going to be these big particles, and when they come to the membrane, they're just going to bounce right off, and so they are not going to go from right to left. Now, my semi-permeable membrane, this barrier, is going to separate two different types of solutions. One is just going to be my pure solvent, so it's just going to be my water molecules. And on the other side, I'm going to have a true solution. I'm going to go ahead and have my water molecules and dissolve a solute in there. And the question is, what happens over time when I have this kind of setup? So let's go ahead and focus in on that barrier. So here's my semi-permeable membrane. I'm going to have my solvent molecules. And my solvent molecules are not going to have any problem going across that membrane. So they're not going to have any problems going from left to right. They are not blocked. So we can think about this as the rate of solvent going from left to right is unimpeded. Now let's think about the molecules on the right hand side of my barrier. Now what's going to happen on my right hand side of the barrier is my solute particles are going to get in the way. They are going to take up some of the space near my semi-permeable membrane, but they can't pass. They're just blocking my route. So what's going to happen is only a few of the molecules, my solvent molecules, can go from right to left. And so if you compare the rates, what you will see is that the rate of my particles going from left to right is going to be much faster because more of them can go from left to right. And so what's going to happen is that I'm going to have a net movement of water molecules going from left to right. And so over time, what you guys will see is the height of these two liquids are going to be different. The side where I have my solute on is going to start to rise. And now what I can do is I can measure my osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure is the amount of pressure that I have to apply on the, on the solution side to make sure that I get these two to be the same height. Now, this is going to be defined by this equation right here. This big pi symbol is going to be the pressure applied I is our Van Hoft factor, M, this is big M, is our molarity, R, our gas constant, and then T is going to be the temperature at which this takes place. And so again, to emphasize this, I don't care what my solute is going to be, so long as I take into account how much, how many moles of solute are in here, that's why osmosis is considered a colligative property. Now, what we can do is we can look at the implication of osmosis. What you guys will note is that I will always have a net movement from pure solvent into solution. So I'm always going to try to put more solvent into the saltier or more concentrated solution. And so this net movement of water has implications when you guys talk about biology. Let's talk about the tenacity of a solution. So in this example, I'm going to have an animal cell. So that's going to be these yellow guys right here. 
Now, animal cells, like most cells, have a, have a semi-permeable membrane. The cell wall allows water to come in and out. And so let's go ahead and see what happens when I bathe my cell in different types of solutions. So understand that inside your cell, it is made out of mostly water and there are things dissolved in it like salts, organic molecules. Now, it doesn't matter what these things are, it just matters how much of it is present. Now, let's go ahead and put that cell in a solution. Now, in this solution, the concentration of my solute is going to be much higher than the concentration inside the cell. This is what we call a hypertonic solution. Now, if this is the case, remember what's going to happen. We are always going to shift water or solvent into the place that has more solute. So what's going to happen is all the water in the cell is going to start to suddenly rush out and my cell is going to shrivel up and die. If you were that mean kid or you knew that mean kid, this is what happens when you, when you pour salt on a snail. It kind of goes under this gross process. And the idea is you're drawing out all the moisture inside that living organism. Let's go ahead and say we put our animal cell in a different type of solution. In this solution, the concentration of the solute is lower than inside the cell. So what you, what you guys can think of is if I put these animal cells into pure DI water. So again, remember what's going to happen. My solvent is going to move into the place where there's more solute. So what's going to happen is suddenly all this liquid is going to rush into the cell. Now, if that happens, the cell is going to swell up and then eventually the cell is going to burst because it has taken in too much water. And this is why, if you guys go to the medical field, why we want isotonic solutions. When we have an isotonic solution, the number of solutes on the outside is the same as the number of solutes on the inside. That means the rate of water coming in and the rate of water coming out is the same and my cell is happy. It doesn't shrivel up, it doesn't explode with water. So another idea that you guys might have come across is something called reverse osmosis. If you want to purify your water or you talk about desalinization plants, this is primarily what's happening. So like its name states, I want to work my way backwards. So in normal osmosis, what's going to happen is that the water is going to go toward the place where there is more solute. And so in reverse osmosis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive this reaction backward. I'm going to take water out of solution or a place where there is more solute. Now to do a reverse osmosis process, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to apply the osmotic pressure, but I got to go beyond the osmotic pressure. And so that's why these processes take a lot of energy. So if you go to a desalinization plant, this is what they do. They are going to bring in salt water from the ocean and they're going to pump this salt water into a tank. They're going to have a semi-permeable membrane. And what they're going to do is they're going to apply a ginormous amount of pressure. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to separate or kind of filter out all the particles or all the solute and leave pure water on the bottom. Now this purified water can go to drinking water, it can uh, fill our pipes and go into agriculture, but what I get out is a super concentrated solution of salty water. Now the more concentrated this is, well the more pressure I have to apply to extract that pure water out. So this is why this process is very intense. We have to keep pumping in water and we can't get it too salty or we're going to have to apply super high pressures to get purified water out. All right, gentle people, here's our quiz for osmosis. Go ahead and run through this and see if you can go ahead and calculate the molecular weight or the formula weight for this polymer. Now I'm going to give you a hint. The polymer is going to stay intact. It is not going to break up into particles when it is dissolved in this solution.
All right, gentle people, what we got is an osmotic pressure. So let's write down the equation for osmotic pressure. So that's osmotic pressure equals I M R T. So I'm going to go ahead and solve for M my molarity. So molarity is going to equal the osmotic pressure over our Van Hofte RT. And so let's go ahead and fill out these. So this should be 0 0.055 atm. And then I told you that my polymer is not going to break up into more particles. And so it gets an I of 1. I'm going to use my gas constant. And so you'll notice I have atms, I have Kelvin, I have moles liters. So this is the R that we are going to use for osmotic pressure. Liter, atms, mole Kelvin. And lastly, let's go ahead and put our temperature in Kelvin. So 27 plus 273. And so if we go ahead and work this calculation out, we get our molarity to be 0 0.00223 moles per liter. Now we want to go ahead and uh, get rid of our liters here. So what we're going to do is going to put 0 0.00223 moles per liter. And now I'm going to times it by the liters of my solution. So 0 0.250 liters over 1. And so in the sample, I had this many moles of my polymer. So the last thing I do is I notice my molecular weight or my formula weight is grams per mole. I use 21.4 grams. I have 0 0.000559 moles. And what I get out is 38.314 grams per mole. And so if we go ahead and look at our choices, that is closest to choice E. So that's going to be what our answer is going to be. Well, Chem1C, I hope that made sense. And remember to stay safe.